Good morning. This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul and Jolene. And today we're talking about Call of Cthulhu. Please don't get mad at us <laughs> if we get anything wrong. We're talking about this as recent players in a few games now under our belts. And uh, my history with COC goes way back to my earliest conventions that I attended, which was specific on here in uh, Northern California in San Mateo. Probably 1982, 83. Anyway. He's really old. <laughs> and I was, it was funny because I didn't care for the people who played Call of Cthulhu at the time, right? Because. You better be really careful where you go with that one. I know. This, I know. I, my mind has changed over the years, right? I have developed. Try a, not to say anything stupid. So I developed a, a taste and an understanding for CLC. For COC and their players. So back in the day, you know, you know, we're playing D and D, and unlike today, which D and D was not hip, was not cool, not not that it's hip or cool or whatever, but it's only more, with certain segments of the population. But it's more accepted, right? Geek is kind of the new chic, right? Because of Big Bang and all kinds of stuff. The Big Bang, the show and stuff. So back in 1980s, early 80s, that was not the case, right? One of our one of uh, the podcasts I listened to called Happy Jacks, the when the main guy or the person who started called Stu, he talks about, oh, no, that stuff would get you put in your locker, right? <laughs> that would get you stuffed in the trash can. And that, and that was just if people found out you played D&D, right? You wouldn't go to the high school with your is your player's handbook in your underneath your arm and say, let's play some D&D, guys. No, at lunch, you know, at the... At the cafeteria. Now they do. They have clubs, D&D clubs. Yes. Those are the changes that we're talking about. D&D and role-playing games themselves have become more mainstream, but still there's still people that go, what's that? This is that for kids? What are you guys just goofing around playing, getting in a costume, you know, and stuff like that. So imagine us from Salinas who didn't wear the badge of RPG on our foreheads or hats or whatever you want to call it, sleeves, and there's these guys dressing up in 1940s garb with suits and fedoras and the women were dressed up and I'm like me and our friends are like who do these people think we are right people people already think we're we're weirdos just for playing an RPG like DD they already think we dress up like weirdos and here they are dressing up like weirdos at least in my mind <laughs> I might have been a little jealous too because I really like the suits even, so even now if that offended anyone, that's just Saul's <laughs> brain. So sorry. It's not offensive. It's just the way I thought in, as a teenager, thinking that, you know, you shouldn't be begging for people to make fun of you because that's basically what, was happen- what would happen. But they were in a safe environment, right? I don't know if they were dressed like that and played and at Denny's like years so later. So anyway. So anyway, we're talking about COC. Over the years, since that first first, first convention I, got, I went to, I've gone to other conventions. There's... Uh, Dungeon Con here in the Bay Area. There's Kubla Con and Pacific Con came back and Big Bad Con. And so going to all these different conventions has exposed me to a lot of different people, right? People I never would have met if I just stayed in my Salinas home in my playing with my friends that I've always played with. Having this exposure, meeting all these new people and I played different games, a lot of these new people I met played Call of Cthulhu. And some of them were really good players and really good GMs. And I'm like, oh, and they run and they love CLC, right? They like CLC. They love playing, running at conventions. And I played in a few and they were really good games. And I still wasn't one over. I don't like the horror elements. I didn't, you know, I didn't like the the idea of losing, right? The dying because, you know, I equated dying with losing. And, uh, and slowly but surely, you know, my friends who I, I'm in a group now, are avid fans of Call of Cthulhu. So they run Call of Cthulhu games, and I play in them. And I found it was really, really cool. So what is Call of Cthulhu? Call of Cthulhu is, the works, is based on the works of H.P. Lovecraft. You know, he wrote in the 30s, died, uh, was a kind of a miserable dude, and was later picked up by uh, Sandy Peterson to base his Call of Cthulhu role-playing game, published in... 
Chaosium Chaosium, by Chaosium in 1981. Ooh, 81. Um, And it was, it had the, it's basically a horror fiction role playing game and it has, uh, they use the basic role playing system, BRP. Yes. So BRP. So it's based on BRP, which is a percentile system. And what I like about that is it, it makes sense with the genre, right? It makes sense to anybody who plays, you know, when you say, well, what are my chances of hitting, uh, it's 35% chance. Oh, people could understand percentages based on 100% chance. Okay, that doesn't sound very good. I'm not very good with a gun. Uh, how about if I punch him? You <laughs> My gun to, isn't very powerful. <laughs> just, yeah, punch him. Oh, 75% chance. Oh, then I'm definitely going to punch him. So stuff like that. The system works really well. It's really neat. There's been seven, what, seven this, editions? They're on the seventh edition. Yeah. So the first one included a 16-page basic role-playing booklet in addition to the main rule book. The second one would, in, in 1983 was a box set. It included a single rule book and minor rule changes. And then the third one, it had separate investigator book and keeper books. They call the GM's keepers, which just freaks me out. Keepers of forbidden knowledge. I guess. <laughs> I, I think, I think of more about. like them as jailers when they say keepers, but that's okay. <laughs> and then um, the fourth edition, they had a Cthulhu Companion Fragment and fragments of fear. The second Cthulhu Companion supplements included with the within in that the fifth edition, um, the first version to credit Lynn Willis as a co-writer, co-author, co-author, and then they had an edition five point five, um, which reorganized and updated the ver- the version of the fifth edition with new cover art, and then the twentieth anniversary edition in two thousand and one was a leather bound hard copy. And it was limited edition bound in green leather with the ancient tome layout. That's pretty cool. I haven't seen that one, but I'm sure someone will show it to me now. And then the sixth edition came out in 2004. Hardcover, softcover, and PDF. Same layout as the 20th anniversary edition. And the seventh edition, it was published in 2016, I guess. Hardcover, softcover, electronic. And it was the rules were significantly re- revised by someone called Paul Fricker and Mike Mason. A new cover art and layout. Yeah, that's the Those latest. Those are the additions. I don't really know the rules. And once Sal talks about the percentile system, we can have another conversation about that. Right. Because all I know is I ask them what I need to roll, and then I try to roll it. <laughs> <laughs> and if I don't, then I lose my mind. So that's fine. So, so I think the, the percentile system is fine. It works well. It's good. Uh, I think another aspect of this game is that it shows, not shows its age, but it shows its roots, right? With the whole idea of rolling your statistics or your attributes, which harkens me to AD&D where you used to roll your attributes instead of point by system. Oh, and, and an important thing to know about that, which I have no idea since I Shannon told me when I was rolling my character, he <laughs> said, you want to roll your stats first and then decide what you want to be. Yes, we discussed that. <laughs> which when, is a very interesting idea. I don't know why we, why we were talking about that, but I remember talking about that when when I made my character. I was planning on being a cop. Remember I was telling you. And I wanted to be a cop, and then I rolled my stats. And, and he couldn't be a cop. Well... Or he could have been a really weak cop. Really (laughs) crappy cop, right? So I'm like, "Mm, this guy seems more stuffy and older. I'll make so I made him a professor, right? Which totally fit with the The game. With the game. And you know and that's what I liked about it, right? That's what I liked about the system, even though it seems kinda old fashioned. Oh, I gotta roll my stats. What happens if I roll really low? You know, I think what happens is is when you roll your stats and you're kinda surprised by the end result sometimes you don't get to make the character that you want and i think that's fitting for call because a lot of times you don't want to be in the position that you're in (laughs) right so it just it just follows works well with the with the whole idea of call cthulhu so when you make a character this way you're kind of forced to play a character that maybe you hadn't intended on playing and i think that causes you as a player to be more into role playing because I think sometimes people fall into these ruts of playing the same kind of character over and over again. And when you're forced to play something that you weren't expecting or wanted to play, you're like, Oh, okay. Makes the player or nudges, pushes, whatever, however you want to say it. To develop their role playing skill more. Right. And to, to role play more instead of falling back to their 
to what they know. You know, and this game is nothing like D and D, because Are you sure I'm positive. So because you're investigators, so you're investigating stuff. You're not going out to kill stuff. Which, get to take their stuff, and you probably don't want their stuff. Um, so it's a, a much more deadly kind of game, right? Where it, or more realistic in the fact that if you get hit by a gun, you're gonna die. Uh, that kind of thing, most right? Likely. Most likely. But the most important part of this game is sanity and luck. Luck comes in because you can use it to make sure you make your roll or re-roll or add or a try dice to or still. try to do it. And sanity comes in because you lose it as you go along. And it just depends on what you see and how you react to it or what your your keeper believes you should have like if you see a dead body, you're going to need to roll a sanity check because right. that's going to cause you to have some kind of, and basically it's a complication. You're going to have a problem with the fact that you're seeing a dead body. When you see supernatural crazy stuff, then, you know, you may go a little bit more insane. And <laughs> Saul was on his way to total insanity <laughs> in one of the first games that, that we, the first game we played, that I played. And it was totally hilarious because he literally... And and Saul's pretty good at the role playing stuff, so he he stopped playing as a, a sane person and really started playing as um, these ideas that he had in his head. I have to do this. This is this is what's going to happen. We need to do this, right? And he was very adamant about those things. So well, it was, I was a professor. <laughs> it was it was pretty it was pretty funny and interesting to see. And I was losing sanity left and right because I was th- seeing things that you know people shouldn't see and. It was very interesting, and in the end, I did go insane and was put in an asylum. Which we all lived, though. I think. <laughs> no, you died. No. Oh, you didn't I die. Lived. Okay. I think. Well, did I die? And it doesn't matter. That is the key to Call of Duty: CLC is the whole sanity mechanic. That is what separates it from many other games out there, if not all games. Right now, lately, there's like Aliens that uses the stress mechanic. That's highly reminiscent of this one. Of this mechanic, but the the panic mechanic and the stress le- uh, mechanic of Alien is a lot more immediate and a lot more like boom, it happens and boom, we have to deal with the situation. Where the sanity mechanic in COC is slowly, so you're slowly losing your mind. Yeah, the, and, the and degradation when you're playing of alien, your mind. When you're playing Alien and you have that the panic mechanic let me tell you you roll a dice if you if you miss your thing and you're either on the ground and you can't do anything and everything's <laughs> happened around you people can kill you while you're there because you can't move that is probably the defining element of coc is that sanity as it slowly gets whittled away by seeing these horrific things hearing about them reading about them and it's just this slow descent into madness, which as a young person, when I was playing, you know, OK, only 10 years ago. So in my 40s, up to my 40s, I didn't really want to play a person descending into madness as they played the game. <laughs> and, you know, but now I'm like, oh, you know, this is just a character. It's not me. It's and it's different from D&D. Right. We're not killing monsters and taking their stuff. You're right. We're investigating stuff. For whatever reason, our character wants to investigate it, either for power, for to stop something nefarious from happening, all kinds of reasons. So the the reason for role playing or for playing is different than uh, adventuring in in Dungeons and Dragons or high fantasy type games. So what's really interesting is that it depends on your GM, right? You know, I've had Matt. He's he's I played in his game. I played in Shannon's game, and I'm playing Morgan's game. And they all run the game differently, you know, and it all has to do with the sanity mechanic because Matt really didn't use it too much. You know, he would make you roll every once in a while when he saw something terrible. Uh, Morgan hardly ever made us roll. I mean, there's certain things he made us roll. And Shannon would make us roll if we saw a dead body. Now, I don't know if I've ever seen a dead body in real life, like on a street or something from a recent accident or something. But I'm not sure it would cause me to lose sanity. But... In this, no, but it would traumatize. You. Yeah, it, it, so so that's what it's about, right? So and it's this multiple traumatic event in a short period of time that causes you to lose sanity. And and Shannon really likes digging into that, right? So his game was really like my character was like, okay, there's a chance that I might be able to do some good, 
I may not make it out to the other side with all my marbles or my life, but I'm going to try. And nobody would listen to me at the beginning of the, of the adventure. And slowly as they descended into madness, they started making, I started making more and more sense. <laughs> so they started listening to me, whether they liked it or not. And then that was Shannon running a, a real horror game that was like, like a haunted house kind it was of thing. set in the 1920s right 20s, right or 20 late 20s but that's what uh, coc that's the the, the idea, traditional the traditional there's other settings too there's right. the the 1920s which is based on the lovecraft stories and then there's also something called cthulhu by gaslight which blends the occult it's set in the 1890s in england and then there's the 1980s conspiracy with cthulhu now and delta green Right. Which, I don't know what that means, but there you go. Delta Green is like a more military operation type stuff. So, more like, it would be kind of dark conspiracy with Cthulhu-ish right. stuff, yeah. So then, sorry if that, if anyone was upset by me saying that. Um, <laughs> no, it's true. So there's the recent editions, including the 1000 AD Cthulhu Dark Ages, and yeah. the 23rd century Cthulhu Rising, and then there's the ancient Roman times, Cthulhu Invictus. These all sound very interesting. And that's very, very cool. Because um, <laughs> I, I like some of those periods. Um, <laughs> really? Especially the thousand years and the Roman yeah, times. Yeah, so, I thought you would. Yeah. Well, uh, Shannon has run a Cthulhu Dark Ages. It's really a really good adventure. Yes. Yes. I don't think he's touched uh, Invictus, the, the Roman one. The, and I find that one very interesting. You know, how do you fight Cthulhu? in Roman times. But then again, just a good It doesn't ch- matter, Yeah, right? the guns doesn't help you at all. <laughs> so, it's all about trying to figure, I, I, I can, that would be cool. I can figure, <laughs> you just kind of go with it. Cause, and then I also learned from playing with um, Shannon and Morgan that you should not be attached to your character. <laughs> you shouldn't be attached to anything in the game. And it's very important to just realize you're going to go insane and die. And then you don't have to worry about it, right? You just do what you do. Um, well, the characters are really fragile, right? You know, and you're right. If you get shot by a gun, it could be really serious, <laughs> yeah, usually, right? And Or stabbed. It's not this heroic adventure where you take all kinds of damage and a wizard or a, or a magic just comes by and heals all your wounds and you're back up and going at it again. Well, and it really reminds me of Dark Conspiracy, the because in Dark Conspiracy, you you kind of wake up and see what's going on around right. you. Exactly. So Call of Cthulhu is the same kind of thing, which really helped me to understand it once I started playing it, because I go, oh, well, it's like Dark Conspiracy, right? <laughs> you actually see the ghost. I think that might actually uh, that might actually uh, upset people more than the previous comment. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just joking. But yeah, there's similar veins of horror, right? That idea that you are special in the sense that you are like dark conspiracy. You see something or something happens in your life that opens your eyes to the real world or the real threat out there. And COC is about forbidden knowledge. And slowly you realize there's just something out there more than, than the real world, right? There's, there's stuff out there that is nasty and hideous and nasty. So if you want to play this game or you play this game, it's usually a, a like an investigation thing, oh, yeah. right? So you're trying to figure out what's going on. Why you're trying to figure out, I don't know, because if, because once you realize that there's something going on, then you're going to start losing your sanity. But I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. Maybe that's why I, I don't totally get it yet, but it's pretty cool and interesting. So one of the, the most interesting things about this game is that it has big supplemental campaigns there's two of them the shadows of yog sothoth <laughs> sorry for butchering the pronunciation do you know how to say that one no and that was came out in 1982 and then masks of oh my god um can Narcolepto you say it for me tep? i don't <laughs> know i just it. yes something yes. like that and that one is written by a guy that i one of my favorite people in the world and somebody else Oh, let's see who was the other person Larry and um, somebody called Lynn Willis Larry Dottilio Larry Dottilio yes um, yeah. and which I never knew until I mean Larry was the guy that taught my my three-year-old and four-year-old when he, I think he was three or four when we when he started playing poison with him which yeah. is a which is a card game so and he was always he's a guy that we've been hanging out at conventions with for my son's entire life right. so I didn't know that he 
did uh, I knew he did something because he did seminars, but he was just Larry, right? One of my favorite people. So, right. um, so I he made this this adventure, and he made it when he was laid off in from or no, he was on strike from his job. Right, and it was, a, it was a writer strike. A writer strike. So he was hired by um, a gaming company, and one of the adventures he wrote was this one. Can and it came that? out the yeah, but yeah. Well, he was hired by several gaming companies to write role-playing adventures. Right. But um, one of the assignments was the Masks of Not Narla. Like the... Yeah, yeah. He he knew all. He knew Sandy Peterson, and he knew, and a lot of people knew him because of that. That he had worked for, for Chaosium, and he was friends with a lot of people here in the Bay Area uh, because, I mean, it was uh, Chaosium was based right here in Oakland, I believe. Right, I think it was Oakland. Or here in the Bay Area, and so he would come up here and talk to him and play games with them. Mm-hmm. And so you know, Nikki was a a person he knew, and they were all would play games back in the eighties and stuff. And yeah, so he was. It was pretty interesting. And you're right, I didn't know who he was, and and it wasn't until you know people were like, "Oh, you know, can you introduce me to him?" I think we told you the story, and I'm like, "Sure, yeah." <laughs> and they were like, they were like, they, they really held him in high esteem. And only later did I find out. Well, oh, he wrote. Oh, he wrote adventures for for Call of Cthulhu, and uh, and he really. That's loved, a really big deal. Yeah. And I'm like going, okay, well, okay, that's cool. <laughs> but then I'm really like, oh, he wrote for you know. He, he did the, our one of our friends. I think it was Andrea or Andrea um, and Lisa. They she really liked Shira. Yes, and she when she found out that we knew him, she, she she heard his name and she's like, oh my god, you know him? And I'm like going. Okay, <laughs> people are crazy. Yeah, he wrote for Shiva the comic and He Man, and, and he also wrote for Babylon Beast Wars Five. and Babylon Five. Right, one of our favorite shows. So he was so so. That's a very interesting part of Call of Cthulhu because and these adventures are big, right? They're the, these yes. campaigns are like huge. They yeah they, they well one I think Mask is considered one of the the best uh, campaigns for Call of Cthulhu, if not the best one, and one of the be- best ever written. Some, you know, the great Pendragon campaign, Pendragon campaign for uh, for Pendragon might be, you know, considered the best. But, uh, you know, Mask is right up there. And they redid it lately when this huge book and there's this little supplemental thing you can buy for it now. Uh, you could buy it. Uh, it might, you know, I don't know if it's out of print, but it's a basic, it's kind of like a box set. And there's like clues that you give out, like it has a match yes. book. And all these like pieces of newspaper, and these are physical clues that you could give your players at the table. And I forget how many clues and bits of information are in this box thing, like ninety nine, and it's just amazing. It's also probably pretty pretty pricey uh, now. Now, yeah, because I have not seen it for sale. You could probably find it on eBay, but yeah, they did all kinds of. It was um, the edition published in the box set. It included a 160-page, perfectly bound, soft cover, original 1983 edition, and various handouts to give to the players um, at various points, including newspaper clippings, handwritten letters, business cards, and matchbooks. Matchbox and a matchbox. Right. And then um, they had other editions in 1990. They added eight color plates. They had all of the other stuff too included. And then it tells you the the campaign. All there's like five different parts of it. So. It was pretty, it, I mean, and then there's other, other settings. I mean, the, I find the interesting one, Delta Green. Yeah. Which I am, um, I, I find it interesting. And there's all kinds of, of course, there's tons of, of source material. Supplements. Supplements and all kinds of different things for whichever genre of Call of Cthulhu you're running. Right. So it's, a, there's even a video game. <laughs> video games and all kinds of things. So, so it's transcended quite a bit of mediums. It, uh, I'm, th- you know, Call of Cthulhu itself uh, or the works of H.P. Lovecraft have been made into movies. You know, kind of like B grade movies. You know, Reanimator and stuff like that. I think there's people have been doing radio plays of them. I know, for for example, uh, the Secret Cabal, the, which is a podcast about mainly board games, but they also love role playing games, but. They usually can't get together, but now they can because of the COVID. They did, a, I think, one or two radio plays, you know, like old-fashioned radio with sound effects and, mm-hmm. and everybody playing a different character and, and one of the uh, a short story by H.P. Lovecraft, which I heard, which was really cool, really neatly done. A lot of hard work because they've only done one or two, and uh, they've been you know podcasting for a long time. 
there's a lot of stuff that you can use for source material for CLC. It is a huge game, right? What I was talking about with Shannon and Morgan, or maybe I did finish talking about that, about how Morgan, you know, I wasn't so worried about yeah, you, going yeah. insane. I was more worried about dying. And and I guess there's other, there's pulp. You know, of course. Different uh, t- styles, right? Right. And there's a Trail of Cthulhu, which is not traditional BRP rules. They use the gumshoe edition. And there's also a, a D20 version. <laughs> That's probably the, a lot of people probably hate that one. D20 Call of Cthulhu, 19, 2001. Yes. Wizards of the Coast. Or well, when, was it when Wizards of the Coast opened up the D20. The D twenty system, right? Open the oh, use the open gaming license. Yeah. There's card games and miniatures, of course, too. Well, there's of course you know Cthulhu Munchkin, right? It has to be Cthulhu Munchkin. Oh, I don't know about that. I haven't seen that one. I'm sure it my is. son loves all the Munchkins. So what I like about Call of Cthulhu is that it's different than most other role playing games uh, of its age, right? You know, these heroic games like Tunnels and Trolls, D and D, Gamma World, Rune Quest, Gamma World. It lacks that high adventure, which I think turned off a lot of people like me because I'm like, that's why I play games. I, you know, I, I play games to mimic the, the movies that I liked when I was young, uh, to mimic stories that I read, the Sword of Shannara ripoff of uh, Lord but of But I've Rings. made you watch so many British mystery shows that <laughs> you may start to really like Call of Cthulhu. Yes, and I think, that, you know, I think you're right. I think it probably has a lot to do with it because... British shows are not adventure, you know, action-packed mo- shows. Don't you know, say they're not, that. They're not. They're just, you know, they're, but they're very well done. And I think when you run a good COC adventure, it feels like a show. It feels like one of those investigative shows. Even the, the Four Hours to Reno, right? Yeah. Which was run by Morgan. And that's the one where I was more worried about getting shot because it's a Western. Well, you did die from getting shot. <laughs> See, I should have been worried. I wasn't worried enough. That's what the key is. But the thing is, with the Call of Cthulhu, usually there's extra characters or you can pick up one of the other characters when you die because you kind of have to. Cause Unless I just leave It's an game. important part because you're gonna, you're, you, might, you might die right. right away. So Shannon, one of the GMs that likes running... Call Cthulhu. He usually has extra characters like NPCs that you can just throw ready at to you. go. <laughs> Especially if you play at a uh, at convention. a convention, right? When we played that game, it was a lot of fun. Both of them. I mean, actually, I played quite a few more. There was one based on a. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But uh, Morgan's run a couple. Shannon's run a couple. And you know, they've all been fun. They've all been a little bit different. And like I said, the sanity mechanic. That's the the one element that can change the game to change the feel of the game shannon likes really digging into that insanity thing going downhill where morgan is a little bit more action orientated at least that's the adventures he's run so far and so your sanity doesn't go down as much but she can die easily but, she, but he loves shooting that you and killing you <laughs> or be possessed by or be possessed <laughs> oh, no, easily that's right <laughs> And then it's always interesting when the and, and since we were playing on roll 20, he sent me a note. Actually, he sent me the note on Zoom saying you have been possessed. <laughs> this is what you need to do. And I'm all and I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to do this because these guys are like intent on on doing things. And I'm all OK, I'm walking away from you. I need to go over here. and I'm doing this. And they're well, all like looking at me funny. And I'm like, OK, well, so. what was funny is I knew something had happened. But then you acted so normal that I go, oh, so nothing must have happened. It must have been. Just because you're insane doesn't mean you don't act normal. Uh, that's true, or possessed. Or possessed. Especially possessed. It really is a d- real departure from most other role-playing games. And I think it's a good game to get into if you want to try something different. Find a good GM that likes running COC. And I think you're going to have a good time. It's whether the test of time. You know, 1981, it's in the 7th edition. It's been, I think it's been in print for us all this whole time it hasn't gone out of print no it hasn't gone out of print and then lie dormant and then brought back to life by some other means you know very few games have had that kind of history of being in print for so long and sandy peterson is back in charge of chaosium i'm not sure if they're gonna come out with another edition because that the seventh edition is pretty big it's uh, pretty brand new i think that it was kickstarted and yes. the publication date probably isn't quite the right date but yeah because it seems like it's newer than than 2015 or 16 when i looked it up on amazon that's what it said 2016 yeah yeah. then then, there you go i'm just telling you yeah that's true 
but it's pretty cool. It's a very cool game. I I suggest that you play it if you if you like um, investigation kind of games. Yes. Just don't get attached to your character or anything <laughs> else, and know that you're going to go insane and die. And if you go into it with that idea in mind, it'll make you play a little more carefully than say uh, that you're a, a fighter in D and D where you can go in and just you know whack things. Right. So that's the most important thing I think you should know about it. And you don't want to take their stuff. <laughs> no, no, you, you don't want their stuff. And well, you don't want to break their stuff because then you might get possessed. Or touch their stuff. Yeah, you, you might want to stay away from anything scary. So it's a very interesting game, and I would recommend it to anybody who wants who likes that kind of 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 genre. There you go. There you go. This is Gaming Perspectives with Saul and Jolene. Have a good day.